Hello everyone. I hope you're doing well. Welcome to Homemakers Radio. If you're new here, please click the link in the description and go to the page on which I have embedded this broadcast and watch the video or listen to the video there. It's mainly for listening and basically because I wanted to provide something for my descendants to listen to while they worked at home or while they did something that was repetitive, sorting things, cleaning things, you always need a little company. And so I decided to read various things and continue homeschooling everyone. And even if you're a great grandmother, that's what I'm doing here. And we'll start out first by making sure that you are prepper, you got your prep done, preparation, which would mean that you would uh, bathe and dress and get yourself uh, happy, put on your happy face and get your list ready because that also, you want to take care of the mind too, that balances the mind. So many of us are famous for lists. We can really make lists and get about one thing on it done. But it it does balance us. You know, people used to make fun of people who sat down and wrote uh, a schedule or wrote lists and it was always very elaborate. It seemed complicated, but it helped them. It helped them balance their minds. And uh, so that's what you need to do is get your list ready. And then we plunge into whatever the most needed thing is in your home. And with, like everything, like medicine, like uh, like education, like transportation, one size doesn't necessarily fit all. Everybody has different needs. Some may need uh, more or less. And so with homemaking, I can't tell you how to do everything because your house is so much different than mine. My house has persnickety doors and windows and things that need special care. And your house is different than mine. How you uh, manage and how you navigate the things that you need to do will be different. So what this is, is generally just something to listen to while you decide what you do next. Now, when you have children at home, it's always smart in the morning to go through and pick up things and make sure there's nothing that will injure them or that they could get um, tangled up in or anything. And so I have found, even though there are two vital people living here, That is still my routine because we sure don't want uh, any uh, accidents uh, in our home. So I go around and look for things that might need to be uh, adjusted, picked up, put away. or And it also helps me to locate things that I think that I have lost. So that is one routine you can do is just walk through your house. If you're having trouble getting started, even if you have your list, just or take your list and walk through the house and you will find many things that give you ideas of what needs to be done but if you have anything that's repetitive or rather tedious that you need to do this is a good time to listen to homemaking radio so if you're new here please click the link in the description box and go to the page in which I have embedded it and I I know I'm repeating myself uh, where you can watch it there and also see maybe some things that I have spoken of and I have um, summarized it or maybe pictures of things around here now one of the things that I like to do when I come here is talk about things in uh, literature in the Bible or or other interesting things that I have read in books and I know some people have asked me why uh, I use so many books and old literature and the main reason is that if I'm using some kind of example of a characteristic or or some habit or thing to do with the home I can always use the character in an old book because you're not going to hurt anybody's feelings because you're not talking about anyone you know and it's always copyright free so like I will read to you out of wives and daughters today but it's just 
it's just for interest and today before I get started I want to share with you my uh, herb of the day or flavor of the day is curly parsley and we had this yesterday in uh, the ladies Bible class in my home and because I like to have herbs of the Bible and this was one of the things included in the herbs that went with the Passover meal the bitter herbs and it was included however I've discovered that even if you can't find the name of a herb in your Bible it is included in Genesis 129 where it says I have given you every good herb <laughs> so if God created it as part of the creation then it's it, then it's a Bible herb but you will need to look this up the health benefits of parsley and also the culinary uses of parsley how to cook it how to use it and this was always familiar to me when I was growing up because it was on every plate even in restaurants and used as a digestive aid and for good breath and but there's more to it parsley is has uh, abundant vitamin A and C in it and it's good for uh, to prevent kidney problems and it's good for heart health and everything else but please go and look this up for yourself do your homework and find out and also I have noticed and you might notice this too that including this in a smoothie or just chewing on it throughout the day uh, takes away your appetite for sweets and for simple carbohydrates like you know breads and things like that uh, so I keep this in the fridge in a jar if I get it at the grocery store or from the garden I clip off the ends of the stem just so it'll absorb water better and it's so nice to open the refrigerator door and see a bouquet sitting there but it reminds me to use it sometimes I get it and it's in a little baggie in the in the crisper drawer and I forget to open it and forget to see but when I see it I can use it so you can it also clears your palate and is it's so refreshing now there are different kinds of parsley this is the one that I used was the curly parsley so I wanted to uh, start out by reading um, from cottage core one of uh, now core means from the heart and uh, you can look that up yourself uh, anytime you see that word it's it's not necessarily a bad connotation but it works well for this this lovely book now I think a lot of you could get a little art journal or something and write your own uh, once you have figured out how this goes uh, it's just uh, every season uh, she has a chapter of things that can be done and they're usually uh, to do with nature and even so even if you are living in uh, in an apartment or anywhere you can do these simple things and so I will read from the summer now some of you are going through autumn because you're in a different uh, time zone than we are but there are wonderful things for the autumn too and uh, because I'm broadcasting from the northern hemisphere I'll read the one about now this is written by Daisy Oakley um, and it's printed in England so and you can get it online so I'll read about the lovely summer day while you get some work done at home a lovely warm sunny morning the purple plumes of the silver birch fast thickening with buds waved and swayed gently in the soft spring air against the deep cloudless blue sky the apricot blossoms were blowing under the silver weeping birch the daffodils were dancing and nodding their golden heads in the morning wind and sunshine this is by an author who uh, she has included a quote from and as it's quite flowery isn't it I don't think I could write like that but here is a quote to lie sometimes on the grass under trees on a summer's day listening to the murmur of the water or watching the clouds float across the sky is by no means a waste of time and this is one of the things that uh, my grandchildren were doing when they were here they were taking the opportunity to lie on the grass and just lay down and look up at the sky 
or and we have big trees too big shady trees and it's quite an interesting different view looking under uh, those huge uh, maples as looking at them it's a totally different world under there it's uh, uh, is quite as Anne would say it gives scope for the imagination and now since we're talking about uh, the wonders of the outdoors and nature and I know a lot of you are probably home housebound but it does it does our hearts good doesn't it to read about it and think about it I'm going to read from Brian Kozlowski's book the Jane Austen diet because he quotes so much of her books and it isn't really a diet. It's a, it's a healthy lifestyle. Uh, so I'll read from his section on the taste for nature. To the cops. Regency estates weren't complete without copses, woodland retreats where heroines idly roam and find near magical refreshment amongst the trees. Now I included in my previous uh, post if you'll uh, go to the page on which I've embedded these videos, I included in the uh, previous post the little path that I walk down when I have a chance to do so. It rains a lot here, but I do have a lot of umbrellas. So I do, I did want you to see that. And when I'm finished talking to you, that is what I'm going to do. I'm going to do my exercises and then uh, go, while I listen to something sweet and then I'm going to go for a walk down that little farm road with the wheat in the background and uh, also going to catch up on some correspondence and clean up my kitchen and uh, also hopefully this is one of my ambitions today and like I said I'm really good at writing lists I am going to cut out a a garment so I have something new to wear a skirt and which should be quite simple but with me it never is because I want everything put away everything tidy before I get out of project it might take me all day to do that um, and you'll find uh, if you're a homebody that because you're home you're using things and that's why there's more to do you have to put it away you have to get it out you have to there's so many different things to do and a lot of people will say I don't see what there is to do at home all day but once you start being a real home dweller and doing most of your things at home you're going to see why uh, it is uh, necessary to to be home and to there's so much to do and there's so much responsibility there at home when you are working for someone else someone else comes in and does all the cleaning all the putting away and you only do one job at home you do everything a wooded grove brings instant comfort to Anne's cluttered mind in persuasion and Lizzie finds inexpressible enjoyment under the tree lined path boarding the Rosings estate this is one thing I did and I wish you were all little again I could take you for a walk and tell you how to think <laughs> this is one thing I did with some of the uh, descendants that came I said we're going to go for a walk and I told them to what to look for on a walk what to feel what to listen possible things and of course they came up with some things themselves that they enjoyed so I wanted to read this description because it was like that um, Marianne waxes poetic when remembering her autumnal walks in Norland's woods how have I delighted as I walked what feelings have they, the season, the air altogether inspired? And how little of that we get when we're off in the commercial world all the time. In fact, the commercial world wants us to just think about that. I was thinking about in past years when the the mothers uh, were so busy going to get groceries, uh, doing errands we used to have to pay bills by hand you know you would have to drive to the place and pay the bill now you can and then later on we could we were allowed to mail them in now you can just send it in but uh, the time that it took and we were out of our homes but not enjoying our world or enjoying the life around us as much as we were all intense on this commercial world and some women could be out even though they were homemakers five hours a day just 
getting things, uh, dropping things off, paying for things uh, while their husbands had to work. So hopefully that is all changing. And now we can have the leisure time to go and discover life, real life around us. And I think of all those mothers and all the time they spent getting food prepared and uh, just the the work they did I don't think was appreciated as much as it should have been but uh, I I had a mother that liked to go out and go for walks and she loved uh, to ha take us on a picnic and she loved uh, we one thing we used to do that was so much fun was pretend we were going for a walk to see our grandmother uh, and some of us who were really little really hoped we were going to see our grandmother uh, but that, I, that was one of my earliest memories, was taking a walk. And then she had a picnic basket with food in it. And uh, she would she taught us just how to sit and enjoy life. And so, interestingly, the same sensations are now associated with one of the biggest health trends in modern Japan, forest bathing. It is the belief that leisurely stroll through the woods is deeply rejuvenating for the body and mind. Well, you know, they went through this back in the uh, late 1800s, early 1900s. Uh, a lot of, even some religions were based on it, on uh, air, air bathing. It is the belief that a leisurely stroll through the woods is deeply rejuvenating for the body and mind. Forest air is particularly rich in fragrant antimicrobial compounds swirling around trees that, when inhaled, can reduce stress and boost our immune system. This is interesting, isn't it? Spending time amongst trees specifically elevates our white blood cells that fight tumors and infections, known as NK cells. According to a Japanese study, and most of us have a Regency-style copse in easy distance, whether it's a wooded park or a backwoods or just beyond our own backyards. There, like Fanny, we can substitute the bad air, bad smells of indoor life for liberty, freshness, fragrance, and virtue. Oh, I don't mind dirt. You know, uh, was, isn't there a doctor online, uh, a naturopathic doctor, herbalist who has written a book called Eat Dirt. <laughs> Is that Dr. Axe? I'm trying to think of who that was. Uh, you know, why Why children? Uh, we, we panic because our little ones are out playing in the mud or the dirt and they, they'll get some in their mouth and we'll just panic. It says here, don't be afraid of good clean dirt. Apparently there's good minerals in it. Lizzie certainly isn't. And speaking of minerals, all the wild things that I like will not grow in my cultivated flower garden. They want to grow by the side of the road where all the gravel is. And that's the reason, I guess, they like the minerals over there. Uh, like the wild clover and the Queen Anne's lace. You can't get that in. You can't get that to grow in my flower beds. Um, Lizzie certainly isn't afraid of good clean dirt. She splashes about in mud on her walk to Netherfield Park bearing her soiled hems with pride. You know, I suggested to my granddaughter when we watched, uh, when she had Wives and Daughters uh, series on while she was here, that we no take note of the outdoor scenes because they, they did such pretty uh, pictures. Um, the camera work was so beautiful. She, the, the evil Bingley sisters were evidently disgusted. She looked almost wild. I hope you saw her petticoat six inches deep in mud. Today they'd be squirting bottles of hand sanitizer down Lizzie's throat if they could. Though Lizzie could easily out with them. You can make your own handmade sanit hand sanitizer with uh, aloe vera, your aloe vera plant. I would suggest you just get an aloe vera plant and and pick off a piece and rub it on your hands is just probably better. In fact, living with a more relaxed attitude toward dirt can give us all clearer heads. Getting a bit dirty, and he's talking about soil outside, the kind you plant uh, vegetables in, gets us in contact with the friendly bacteria in soil um, and usually inhaled whenever people potter about in dirt. 
it reduces it, he talks about the uh the name of it which i don't dare try to pronounce or i will just mess it up he says this ingredient reduces anxiety by boosting the positive brain chemical serotonin in ways very familiar to antidepressant pills that's why i hear a lot of gardeners say how therapeutic it is maybe uh they've had uh, people i know you know have had maybe a very disastrous event in their life uh someone just threw them for a loop or or some big huge change in their life and it almost knocked them over almost uh leveled them and they got busy pulling up grass pulling up weeds planting things pottering about in the garden and got healthy from it Garden soil and garden air has always been the best source of this natural high. So, if you're on any kind of uh, allopathic medicine that is chemical, you can substitute it all uh, because those things have side effects, whereas this kind of thing, this natural thing does not have anything but a good side effect. Uh, you might get a little bit sunburn and maybe... Uh, maybe bring in a bit of dirt as a side effect. Charlotte Palmer is clearly a happy soil sniffer in Sense and Sensibility. Merely strolling through the gardens and greenhouses at Cleveland raised the laughter of Charlotte to giddy heights. I really enjoyed this. Um, if you would, please pray for Mr. Brian. Kozlowski who wrote this he got a little bit ill a little bit ill a lot ill he's been sick and uh, and you know the reason I know I have inside information because he's an honorary member of my family <laughs> and uh, so now I'm going to read to you out of uh, Eric Sloan's weather book because it goes with what I have read here out of lying in the uh, grass on a sunny day and looking up through a tree and what I have read here about uh, walking around and digging in the dirt or just being outdoors so it's the Brian Kozlowski's weather book and one of the reasons there's so much unease in our lives whether you're at home or not that just some something just doesn't set right is that you're blocked off from the world of nature and information about it I mean, you could still be home and you could still be sitting in the country but you have no clue what's going on around you whereas if you knew more about what people in the past knew about and were aware of uh, there's there's an added ingredients of a sense of well-being and happiness and uh, a feeling of stability so I want to read out of this man's book here called Eric Sloan's Weather Book. Now I'm homeschooling you and if you are homeschooling your children get this book just to, uh, and don't just you know hand it to them but do what I'm doing and just read something interesting. So I'm going to read the part it's all about the signs of rain uh, but later on in this book I'm sure there's going to be more about signs of sun now all about the signs of rain and last time I discussed uh, the way that the swallows got close to the ground, you know, when the air pressure changed, because and 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 how it irritates the brains of the bats, and they'll screech when the air pressure is bothering them. And so there was a poem that was written that he included in this his book, written in 1949 or published in 1949. He did not write the poem, but he wanted to use it. He said, here is an old rhyme that is so crowded with weather lore evolved from the accurate observation that the reader can almost feel the rain gathering and getting ready to come down. Well, we got down to uh, uh, low o'er the grass, the swallow wings. The cricket, too, how sharp he sings. So let me read what he says. Then he starts defining all of this. The cricket, too, how sharp he sings. So let me read that to you. The cricket, too, how sharp he sings, indicates that the old-timer observed the effect that weather has upon insects, especially crickets, which are astoundingly accurate atmospheric instruments.
It has been recently learned that the cricket's reaction to temperature is often more immediate and accurate than that of the average thermometer, hmm. which is considerable lag, uh, which has considerable lag and variation. Yeah, the thermometer doesn't often catch up too quickly to the uh, actual temperature. If the chirps of the black cricket are counted for 14 seconds, and the number 40 is then added to that figure, you will get the exact temperature of the air where the cricket is in degrees Fahrenheit. And this drawing number three, which I could probably put that on uh, the page for you. You will also find the Katie did a responsive insect thermometer. It's called, it's called lengthening the, with warmth and shortening and finally ending completely with the cold atmosphere. Yes. So I wanted to read that to you because it was, it's one of the signs of the weather. So it says here that the Katie did uh, will have a call that lengthens with the warmth and shortens with the cold. And these things uh, might not, if you're, if you're tuned into uh, the uh, media all the time and you're dependent on the media, these things don't have any meaning to you. You just listen to the weather, but ev there's little temperature changes in every district, so the media weather can't cover where you are. So I'm going to read a little bit of Wives and Daughters, and then uh, the last 15 minutes of this broadcast, I hope to uh, do the people part, which I find I've taken some notes and they are most interesting today, at least to me. So I left off uh, when Molly went to stay with Mrs. Hamley and she was surveying her room and looking around and then she looked, she and Mrs. Hamley discussed the portraits that were painted uh, from crayon of uh, her son's Osborne and Roger. So now, uh, as Molly was, you know, thinking, uh, she was brought out of her reverie uh, with the dressing bell rang for the six o'clock dinner. Well, you know, in large families, some of us have had to have a bell. When I have people here, uh, my descendants here, I have to have a bell. Uh, because I'm sure they'd get tired of hearing me yell out, Dinner! Uh, Molly was rather dismayed by the offers of the maid whom Mrs. Hamley had sent to assist her. I'm reading from Wives and Daughters by Mrs. Uh, Elizabeth Gaskell. I'm afraid they expect me to be very smart. She kept thinking to herself, If they do, they'll be disappointed, that's all but I wish my plaid silk gown had been ready. She looked at herself in the glass with some anxiety. That's a mirror. And as I said before, these people like Jane Austen and Elizabeth Gaskell wrote to the people of their own generation, so they wouldn't have had to explain that. We don't call it a glass anymore. We call it a mirror. She saw a slight, lean figure promising to be tall. Wouldn't that be nice to look in the glass? To look in the mirror and see a slight lean figure <laughs> promising to be tall. <laughs> yes, that's what I want. <laughs> a complexion browner than cream colored, though in a year or two it might have, have that tint. Plentiful curly black hair tied up in a bunch of in a bunch behind with a rose colored ribbon, long almond shaped soft gray eyes shaded both above and below by black curly eyelashes. Yes, wouldn't you like in the mirror and see all that? Uh, a brown complexion and a uh, and black curly hair and black eyelashes. I don't think I am pretty, thought Molly, as she turned away from the glass, and yet I am not sure. She would have been sure if instead of inspecting herself with such solemnity, she had smiled her own merry sweet smile and called out the gleam of her teeth and the charm of her dimples. 
she found her way downstairs into the drawing room in a good time she could look about her and learn how to feel at home in her new quarters the room was forty feet long or so fitted up with yellow satin at some distant period and high spindled legs and chairs and pembroke tables abounded she said in the previous page that i read last time of how uh, antique this house felt with old furniture so they had their antiques too and they thought it was uh, from a time before them they thought they were very modern and also the idea that she went downstairs and looked in the drawing room and looked around so that she could figure out how to feel about this room that interested me because I think we should always teach uh, our children when they enter a place to to get a sense of it of everything to be aware of everything to as the bible says uh, be circumspect to be able to see around uh to see if, if anything that they might need to you you collect a lot of information in your mind when you first enter a place but you need to look and see uh what's going on there and uh, make sure you know where the door is so you can leave and just kind of figure everything out when you enter a place and uh, and don't be uh, just focusing on one thing. And so now I'm going to, since I've been reading Rives and Daughters and Jane Austen, I want to go into character. Uh, I call this the people part, but being a homemaker and a homeschooler, we found, uh, and, and it possibly could, could be because we were in a church and I was a preacher's wife and we traveled different places and... Uh, had di different uh, things presented itself to me that sometimes were puzzling, but eventually I began to figure some of it out and uh, about how people behaved. And so I wanted to read this little scripture from First Peter chapter four, verse twelve. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. Now here's the big problem. Uh, when you're a young person and someone all of a sudden uh, turns around and yells at you or gets mad at you, you can be puzzled. You, you, you think something strange had happened to you. But some people are just that way and they made that, they made that their habit and it doesn't necessarily mean that something's wrong with you, but it is designed to give you a complex and a fear and uh, uh, make you unhappy. Some people just like to take away other people's unhappiness. And what was it? An old novel I read that said, "Do we do do we just knock happiness off when we see it sitting on a post?" <laughs> and some people do that. Uh, they think they have to do that. And so I wanted to uh, do two types of uh, things that might uh, confront you. And the children all need to be taught this. So they can figure out life and not be slayed by everything that happens to them. Okay, I'll start with the first uh, first occurrence. And that would be someone who tells you just before retirement, just before everyone's going to sleep, turning all the lights and going to sleep. And there, maybe you've had a friend over or a guest or maybe just someone in the family and sa who says to you, the world is um, going to end tonight. Or uh, this is a terrible place to live. There's going to be this and this and that. And it's all going to happen. And they frighten everybody just as they're getting ready to go to bed and put these terrorizing thoughts in their heads so that no one can sleep. And in the meantime, this person, whether it's a visitor or maybe someone that you're looking after in your own house or just for some reason is in your life uh, after everyone uh, is like wide awake they snore away they're happy or they even um, go to bed whistling or singing while everyone else is unhappy uh, maybe they not just give them bad news but tell everybody how bad they are and so everyone no one can really have a restful sleep because of the horrid feelings that this caused so I just would say observe this and also make sure you know uh, that it's not true and a lot of people hesitate I know uh, it's not good to get in an argument or confront people but uh, maybe ask them to 
um, prove it and then get them so involved in boring details and get them talking and then you start whistling and go to bed <laughs> and be happy. Um, the other thing uh, is, and of course everybody, this is just my opinion uh, based on my limited experience and some of my own weird humor. So everybody needs to solve these things for themselves. But in the olden days, we always knew someone who would tell you something really awful just before a meal or bedtime. It would spoil your appetite and spoil your sleep. And uh, we were taught in old, old-timey old manners um, by our parents not to do that. Uh, another thing as uh, you might have to deal with is someone will ask you how your garden is doing or how are you doing with building your house or how is uh, how's your health doing or something like that and you might just honestly answer it and say uh, the uh, the slugs ate everything this year or the the snails ate everything and I was so disappointed or might say well we had a little delay on our house because one of the workers got sick or something like that and uh, you're just giving general information but the other person is be sure to say well I see things aren't do going very well for you I'm very sorry things aren't going well for you <laughs> and that's not good news you don't need to hear that kind of response uh, how do you like to be told that things aren't going well for you. Doesn't it make you feel a little bit unsuccessful and uh, unhappy and kind of de defeated? So here's where it's your fault. And I had to learn to do this too. Uh, don't give too much information. Just say it's going as well as can be expected under the circumstances. I have great plans for its improvement. Just do the Jane Austen thing and uh, keep their negative minds healthy. It's not good for them to go around saying things like that too. I'm very sorry that uh, things aren't going so well for you. Uh, you want to be careful about what you tell people. Um, there are also those who like to extract apologies. They are just not ha happy. They are just not they can't hardly live. They don't have any steam. They don't have any, their minds can't work and, and their blood isn't flowing unless they have uh, got somebody to apologize to them. So they extract apologies. Um, you ignored me last time I saw you. You uh, you told me such and such and, uh, and of course they took it all wrong, but they want to extract an apology. They don't feel good. And you will notice a pattern in those types of people as they constantly do it. They are always extracting apologies. Now, for me, I understand that uh, the Bible doesn't say anything about apology. As it suggests that uh, you can ask for forgiveness. You can say, please forgive me. But people who love apologies, uh, they're gonna, it's, it's designed to control you. So if you apologize, they kind of have you in, in their power or control you sometimes. But to ask for forgiveness, to me, is more effective and more biblical this, this idea of going around apologizing all the time. I don't know where that came from, but it's a it's kind of a human designed man made thing, um, and uh, so they like to extract apologies constantly by making you feel guilty or bad. And of course, if you have done something, you could ask them to please forgive you. Well, they don't like that because that's going to take some effort on their part. That's going to take something out of their heart. Uh, if they forgive you, it means they're releasing you and uh, they can't hold anything over you anymore and they cannot exert uh, pressure or guilt on you. So you need to uh, figure this all out for yourself. If you've got one of those apology extractors. Now, when I was growing up, we didn't have psychology and we didn't have all the things you could read about stuff like this. And so... <laughs> these apology uh, extractors people would just laugh at them <laughs> and uh, and defeat them that way um, but is, in later times we they get very serious you know you have to be so careful they might take you to court or they might you know and do something else and so you have to be very careful with it um, 
so if you read, uh, and like I say, I, I use the literature because you can't hurt anybody's feelings. Because if you talked about somebody, uh, they can't uh, they can't accuse you of anything. Like Anne of Green Gables. Uh, she was forced to apologize to Mrs. Lynde, and oh, she did not want to do that. But she finally decided to do it, and when she did it, she overdid it. Do you remember that from the book or from one of the movies where she just went on and on and on about how sorry she was, and Mrs. Lynde had just about had enough, and um, she said, well, that will do. <laughs> and so exaggeration was a great tool for her. Um, and you can see it all through these old comedy novels, like Jane Austen's novels were comedies, and you can even see it in uh, Cynthia in Wives and Daughters, uh, where she should she should have apologized, but she said, "I I made up my mind not to think about it." Uh, but asking for forgiveness is totally different. That's a sincere effort to make things right. And uh, so the apology extractors, I don't have uh, much use for them because they are never going, that's never, it's an addiction that they have to have and it'll continue. Uh, and they'll move on to someone else. So those are just a couple of things that you might want to think about. Maybe it has no effect on you at all. But I want to tell you about something that's going to re-emerge its ugly head. And it started way back in... Uh, uh, the Greek li Greek literature and uh, in the ancient Greek times and uh, then in the 1930s w during the depression it re-emerged and it was a saying um, called escapism and the reason I'm going to tell you about this is that you are going to be accused of being an escapist or being uh, or accused of escapism when you start to be a homemaker happy homemaker you want to make a, make your own clothes or you want to watch a Jane Austen movie or you want to wear a costume to a reenactment or have a tea party or even have a teacup as you can see this is my teacup for today and I'm wearing a dress it looks like a uh, and I don't think I can show it to you but uh, this is my teacup for today and uh, they're going to say she's into escapism. Um, and I got this dress at Walmart, and it was one of those time and true dresses that came out in the spring. But it isn't very long, so I had to add a, a petticoat under it so it would be a little bit longer because I'm too tall for some of these things. But uh, so, you know, you're wearing a, a dress that's kind of uh, Austinese or maybe even more Victorian. And uh, so they'll say you're into escapism or you're homemaking, or you're homeschooling, or you're uh, doing other things. And so this word escapism is coming out again. And uh, don't ask me uh, where I got this information, but I went and looked it up, and here's what it says. And this is what what's coming. This is what you're going to run into probably pretty soon. Escapism, originally an Americanism, which it wasn't. It goes way back for the, it was It was a French word. Uh, in the beginning uh, back in the 1800s and then before that it was Greek and it was uh, to describe a person who seeks diversion from reality and who was it in one of the novels we talk about here that says I am excessively diverted <laughs> diverted can't think of who that was um has been ascribed to John Crow Ransom, founder of the Southern New Criticism School of Literary Criticism in 1930. And this was during the Depression. And doesn't it figure School of Criticism, Higher Criticism? Uh, it says, it, and it described the tendency to escape from the real world to the safety and comfort of a fantasy world. Since life is stressful, coping strategies are essential to making it through each day. Now, one of the th reasons that they used this back in the Depression, and also back in the 1970s, I was alive then, because uh, I'm an antiquity now, a vital antiquity, uh, there was the, uh, 
all kinds of uh, financial crises in the United States and people were uh, being laid off of work or change, having to change jobs and a news I remember specifically I was about 23 years old and a news uh, broadcast came on that said that uh, the Western uh, novels were just being sold out of the stores that people were buying Westerns and reading them and uh, it was a type of escapism because people had lost their jobs. And um, so the writers, of course, were busy writing these novels. They weren't called escapists, but the people that were reading were called, uh, saying that they were into escapism. So now you get the problem of people who are, who haven't lived like we have lived and don't understand uh, the fun of an enjoyment of uh, learning about other eras and learning uh, to replicate some things that are good. Like we, we repeat and we replicate. Uh, one of the things we love about the Jane Austen books and the Elizabeth Gaskell books is that they did things that we can repeat today. We can have our tea. We can sit by the fire. We can uh, wear a hat. We can, we can do all these things and there's no harm in it. And uh, so just a minute, I'm going to close something here. Someone out there with a radio on. So I would like to ask the people who really think that we are escapists. Um, for instance, they uh, will see someone who is dressed up and call them an escapist or someone who's who works at home or who stays at home and call them escapism. And the, the idea is, of course, if we don't follow the uh, narrative and the agenda of uh, a cruel world and just sit there and uh, uh, endure it all the time and decide instead we're going to go read a book or write a book or write a story or tell a story or um, maybe have a cup of tea that we are escapists. We're, we're escapists and we're into escapism. It's supposed to be some kind of psychological insult to, to call someone an escapist. Um, but let me ask some questions here about that and so maybe you'll be equipped to ask questions about this escapism that we're going to all be accused of uh, in, in our lo lovely little lives at home. Um, is making a list escapism? Because I make them. I make long lists and it helps, they help my mind. And, and I have this strange list today that I'm going to, I'll tell you what, I really am into escapism, if this is true. I wrote down that I'm going to clean the kitchen and I'm going to go for a walk and I'm going to take my little notebook with me and make some observations. And I am going to write some letters hmm. and uh, then I'm going to try to get out some fabric and cut out a skirt and I thought as I was looking at that thinking about escapism boy that I don't know if that's escapism but that's fantasy because I write that stuff down over and over and might be doing one thing on there and so when I wrote down make a skirt I thought well I don't know if that's fantasy or escapism <laughs> Because I don't think I'll get it done in one day. It won't be on, uh, it'll be on the list again tomorrow. But let me ask, is singing an old song or playing an old song on the piano escapism? Is listening to classical music uh, escapism? Is traveling to a historic site uh, for a little tour uh, escapism? Is... Uh, is camping out uh, escapism? You know, we find a lot of people in my area, they like to go uh, rustic and they like to camp out and they just like to hearken to their earlier pioneer uh, ancestor days. And uh, is that escapism? Is attending a pioneer event, you know, dressed up, my daughter made me a costume to wear to someone's pioneer party. And they, we spent all day out at her grandmother's farm doing, uh, eating pioneer food and playing pioneer games and um, enjoying the uh, pioneer life for a day. We washed clothes by hand and we uh, 
uh, made soap, and we did many other things. Uh, is attending a Shakespearean festival where everyone says thee and thou, is that escapism? Um, is a, a, attending an Austin tea event? or a, There was one that I went to where everyone dressed uh, Austinese, even the men, and we promenaded down a, the, the oldest part of this city uh, that would have been most, most like that. Is that escapism? Now, we also had Civil War encampments here in the U.S. Uh, where people learned to, they stayed in tents. And uh, is that escapism? Or is a Victorian afternoon tea that you invited your friends to, is that escapism? Um, and uh, so there's just so much. What about reading the Bible? That's, that's history. Is that escapism? You know... Uh, they think that unless you sit in misery and dress the way that the uh i don't know who decides what the fashion is i don't know who decides how we dress who decides uh, i rebelled against that uh you know the things that are commercially sold is that what we're is that the dictates of it you know uh unless you're sitting in misery and uh and just enduring everything with no point you you're accused of uh, mentally escaping. And so when we were growing up, we did things that made us happy. Uh, we listened to classical music. We sang. We went for long walks. We had picnics. Um, you know, enjoyed uh, drinking out of a teacup. Enjoyed reading stories. And, of course, my mother's mother, my grand grandmother was an orphan, came out on the orphan train. And... Uh, we they generationally have loved Anne of Green Gables because Anne was portrayed as an orphan. And so unless we're following the, the modern agenda and the prevailing culture, we'll be accused of escapism by these uh, pseudo-psychologists or whatever you want to call them. Now, I thought you would en enjoy knowing about that because it's really old. It came from... It was prominent during the uh, Depression, where uh, that was when a lot of storytellers started going around, and uh, you could you could hire a storyteller to come in and entertain you. That was when a lot of the music, uh, the fiddling, and that's when uh, there were a lot of good things that happened as a result. Because you don't want to just sit there and wallow in uh, poverty and sorrow and disaster you get yourself up and you try something else and you try to get away from it that's not escapism that's just uh common sense and even the bible talks about things like that when uh when moses or uh, elijah or one of these people complained about uh something the misery they were in or being all alone in something that they were doing god always told them to get up and go do this, or go and do this, whatever. So were they escapists? So uh, I just wanted to tell you about that because one day someone's going to come and watch one of these and say that she's she's into escapism. And that is the new thing that's coming around. And I think that um, I don't know if people are going to develop. We have to be really careful with our young people that we don't let them develop any kind of peer pressure over it or to feel inferior about it. As a matter of fact, when I was growing up, I was told by Christians to be careful when you're young not to get yourself in a situation where you're at a social disadvantage, where there's constant uh, criticism or uh, challenges and you're too young to uh, counter to counter it all, because we're still when you're young, you're still in training, and uh, so, ladies, I hope that you've had a good time while you're here, and I would like to leave you on a better note. So I just hope you get a lot done while you're here, and I wanted to tell you how uh, blessed I am that you came, because if you weren't here, I wouldn't come here and talk, even though I'm leaving it for my. Um, for my people uh, but you're the one that motivates me I love your comments and I hope to answer them all I hope to get to the mail also and get some 
answers to all your cards and letters. Thank you for all that you do for me, especially for your encouragement and for your prayers. So until I see you again, please keep your mind on Christ, and I'll talk to you later. Bye.